everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, coming to you from the luxurious <laughs> Four Seasons. Four Seasons Landscaping. Uh, <laughs> Welcome oh, to my press so conference, good. people. So good. <laughs> it's humor, okay? We're not getting yeah. political here. It's all no. humor. Um, uh, before we get to this week's guest, and it's a fascinating discussion about a 50-state virtual tour, um, quick shout out to Hypebot and Bands in Town for thanking you for all your support. And of course, to our sponsors, Bandzoogle.com, Built by musicians for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a beautiful website and EPK. Banzoogle powers the websites for tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, including hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools, social media integrations, and of course, amazing live tech support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. We put together a cool little offer for the Music Biz Weekly listeners and viewers out there. Head over to bandzoogle.com, sign up and try it for free for 30 days, and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY and you will get 15% off the first year of any subscription. And of course, discmakers.com. We know it's a digital world, but there's still an important role for physical media for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are so small that selling products like CD, vinyl, t-shirts online and at your gigs, physical and virtual gigs, has become such an important income generator. For every CD you sell at a gig, or online, you'd need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money, and that's a lot of streams. That is a lot. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. So another offer we put together for our listeners, head over to discmakers.com, place an order for 100 or more CDs, and when you check out, use the promo code FREEBIZ, and you will save up to... $150 in shipping. So Jay, today's guest, Michael Crumper from Missing Peace. You know, Missing Peace does a lot of, a lot of things, marketing, publicity, management, label, all sorts of things. But what we were kind of excited to talk about, and it's something you and I have been talking about uh, a lot lately, uh, especially, you know, under this uh, pandemic, you know, kind of these uh, virtual shows and virtual tours. And he did a 50 date tour with one of his artists and uh, fascinating discussion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm excited to talk to Michael, how this happened, what challenges did they encounter? Um, I think we can all learn a little bit about how to put together a virtual tour because, you know, as we discussed a few weeks ago, Real tours may not be back until 2022, people. Yeah, not for a while. So you got to be taking this virtual stuff seriously. It's about time. Yeah. So yeah. let it roll. Build a stunning band website in minutes with Banzoogle. Go to Banzoogle.com to start your free 30-day trial and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Michael Crumper from Missing Peace. He is the CEO founder. Did I get that right, Michael? You did. You did. Good to speak with you guys. Pleasure. Good to speak with you too. And before we uh, started recording, you had uh, mentioned um, how you kind of got started with this business. And I think it might have involved my uh, my business partner, Jeff. It did. It did. So um, I had this kind of harebrained idea um, to start a company initially focused on public media, on NPR uh, outreach and PBS outreach. And um, one of the first people I started talking to was Jeff. um, And I approached him and uh, worked on one project for him. I worked on the Cat Stevens Yusuf record uh, that came out. and 
we got a lot done. And really, honestly, the idea was, I just left Razor and Tie, where I was head of marketing. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, and um, and so the initial idea was, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'll start pitching some people, and maybe this will be a way for me to have uh, conversations with folks so that I can get in and get another job, um, rather than just sending a resume around. And so um, I got. Uh, you know, we did work on this Cat Stevens thing. I went out to LA, talked to a bunch of people, met with Jeff, and proposed the idea of doing this on retainer. Um, Jeff said yes, uh, and then I felt like, okay, I got a company. If I can do this and I have one client to work with me for a while, um, then I can pitch this to other people. Um, and um, I have worked worked on uh, stuff with Universal going on like for like nine years with them working on stuff. So uh, that was a pretty fruitful relationship. Um, yeah, and so you're you know, sending him time. residuals, right? <laughs> uh, I guess I forgot. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe you can buy him lunch next time you're in town. I, I'm happy to, I'm happy to buy him lunch now. Um, but um, yeah, and really that was just, you know, that was just me kind of starting the company around my dining room table, um, you know, with no one else. And in fact, uh, part of my thinking was I'm going to name the company Missing Piece Group because it sounds bigger, mm -hmm. um, even though it was just me. Um, you were the group. Uh, and, um, and that seems to have worked because we're now uh, a dozen people. Um, so uh, now we are actually a group of people. That's well. It sounds like you've uh, you've built quite a company. For those that don't know about Missing Piece, you do a lot there. You do marketing, publicity, artist management, label, kind of runs the gamut there. Do you have a partner as far as distribution? Yeah, we're distributed through Caroline. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And honestly, um, people, when, um, when I talk to them, I feel like I have to actually get in front of them and explain, here's all the things that we do. Um, uh, because I, there are very few companies like us. Um, and that is absolutely by design. I, you know, I didn't want to just start a company that did just publicity. I didn't want to just start a company that, um, I mean, and, and it, I can't say that this was, um, you know, all part of some grand business plan. I mean, my, the way that I have built a company is kind of coming up with an idea, course correcting, see if it works and sure. to that. And that's really how it, how it's happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, the general idea of Missing Piece was actually, the company was named uh, after the Shel Silverstein's book. So the Shel Silverstein book, Missing Piece, I was looking at my daughter's bookshelf at the time, saw the book and I was like, okay, this is perfect. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and then it really kind of fit with what the whole idea of the company was, which was that, um, it was exactly, I mean, and I, I like to say, I mean, so I started the company December 2008. So I left Razor and Tie, and I literally felt like, okay, I'm starting a company in one of the weakest businesses in the worst possible economic times. So it can only go up from here. Um, and um, of course, you didn't foresee 2020. Did anyone foresee? 2020? <laughs> Uh, in their worst nightmares. Um, no, but, um, you know, so, so the fact was that, you know, it seemed like companies were cutting staff, distribution was becoming easier and easier to do. Art, you know, recording was coming easier to, easier to do. So you had artists that wanted to market and self-release records. You had labels that were understaffed and needed to have people to, to help market their releases. Um, and so basically we could complement what 
someone needed. And we could be a number of things. So for a lot of artists, we are, um, we act as the record label, you know, and what that means is we'll do uh, full marketing plans, we'll do DSP pitching, we'll do publicity, product management. And in fact, we'll even go as far as finding distribution for products. There's a number of times where someone will come and we'll say, you know, uh, they'll have a master and we will approach a bunch of distributors to find the right home for them. Um, you know, we'll commission videos, commission photo shoots, we'll do really whatever is needed and we'll even kind of, I think, often step in and take on some management duties as well. It just, it's a case by case basis in terms of what clients need. Sure. Uh, and that then goes to uh, the kind of a la carte stuff that we do as well. So there's a lot of clients that we work just publicity. There's some clients that we work um, just, you know, digital marketing and marketing stuff. And, and we kind of, I got kind of frustrated when I was running marketing at, at companies at the inflexibility of the indies that I hired, you know, and a little bit of the folks um, who made you feel like you should be grateful that they took you on. Um, and my feeling was, I want to start a company that, that really works so closely with the clients and, 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 um, and also does it in a way that is as professional as the companies that I wanted to hire when I was, you know, running things. And so, um, and it seems to really have worked well, you know, but beyond the services side of things, um, over the years, um, we have released a whole batch of records. And this year, actually, we're releasing more records than I think that we ever have. Um, some through our relationship with, uh, with Caroline, we've picked up a couple of, of British acts from, uh, from Caroline UK and Communion. Um, and then uh, I was Duncan Sheik's product manager 25 years ago. Uh, and um, so next month we're releasing a live Duncan Sheik record, um, which is awesome to have that kind of come back around all these years later. And, yeah. and that kind of happened a little bit with a number of other things. I mean, I put out a Matthew Sweet record because I was Matthew Sweet's publicist and was involved with him forever ago. So some of that is just kind of taking care of people and working with people that, that whose music I loved. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, we've managed acts over the years, and currently I'm, I'm managing Brendan Benson. Um, I've worked with for the last couple of years, and um, sure. so yeah, I mean, it it definitely. What I like to think about is that, like, I think that each of those different things you can leverage on behalf of the other part of the company. So, if you know. We just put together a really successful live stream with Brendan, where Brendan did um, the first full band performance of stuff on the album that he put out in the beginning of April. And figuring out how to do that successfully um, informs what we can do for the other clients we work with sure. and opens relationships for other clients as well. So it, it really, you know, it really does, it works. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. One of the things that Michael and I um, were talking about, um, which we think is really interesting, is what you've done with uh, Zach Heckendorf, specifically the uh, the 50 state, you know, live stream tour. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Can you um, touch a little bit about, you know, how that kind of came together and and what that was all about? Sure. And, and I do want to give credit there's a guy named frank woodworth um who uh worked as a consultant on the project with us he handled some marketing stuff on our team when we were a bit understaffed and um and it was frank's idea so uh i like to uh do something unusual which is actually give people credit uh, <laughs> in this uh, business it's a unicorn yeah it's not so um but so the deal is, is that um, Greg Latterman and I started talking about Zach almost exactly 
a year ago around this time. Um, and Greg was just kind of getting back into the music business after um, doing other things which were far more successful. Um, and, uh, you know, and he, um, he had worked with Zach years ago um, and Zach uh, had written and recorded some new songs and I was kind of blown away by them. And so we did kind of an unusual thing where um, uh, Greg hired us, um, but I still wanted to be so involved with the record and have some skin in the game that it, it came out through our label. Um, and um, was really kind of knocked out by Zach. Zach actually came to our offices in New Jersey, had played like four or five songs acoustic uh, and sort of blew everyone away. Um, so that honestly, and, and, I, and I learned later that that is very much the template uh, that Greg did years back with John Mayer, you know, doing the same thing, just impressing people in, in you know, very small performances. So that was our, you know, part of our plan, our genius plan. And, you know, we went into a number of different distribution companies and other places. And, and in fact, Greg took Zach out um, to Live Nation's office uh, and perform for the Live Nation team. Uh, and this is all happening just as quarantine is starting to come together. And in fact, I know like Zach went and performed in Caroline's offices literally right before they entirely closed, um, uh, you know, in terms of people working in the office space. So, you know, the idea had been like Zach was so amazing playing solo and that the opportunity for him to be able to open for a bunch of people seemed so perfect to happen. And then all of a sudden that was entirely gone. And how the hell do we put someone that's such an amazing performer in front of a ton of people? And so um, one of the things we had talked about is that Sufjan Stevens years back had um, you know, made a, a big deal of the fact that he was gonna record an album for every state of the union. Uh, and never did. He ended up doing about three. And so we thought, okay, well, um, we're going to try to go the distance and try to do um, a performance tied to every state. And that could mean that it was um, through an Instagram that was through uh, a radio station that was playing Zach. It could be an artist that lived somewhere and it was going to be a Q&A with them. It could be um, a record store that was there, that there was some direct tie. Um, and Live Nation became a great partner in this. And uh, we did, um, I think it was something like 30 or 40 performances out of um, 13 different states that were tied to Live Nation venues. Uh, and that all came because they were uh, so impressed by seeing Zach live. So did, um, did, did Live Nation take on the role, I guess, of the booking agent and, and finding the, the quote, virtual venue for the not, performances? Not, not exclusively. Um, you know, we did a ton of that work ourselves and then Live Nation, um, you know, basically solicited a batch of their partner venues. And so, for instance, there was a point where Zach did like performances tied to five live nation venues in California simultaneously. So yes, there were, it, it was um, very much in partnership with Live Nation for a, a lot of places, but we definitely filled it in um, with a batch of other um, places wherever we thought. Was what, what were some of the challenges you encountered and, and how did you overcome them in putting together a virtual tour because this is something that Jay and I have have talked about a number of times on you know with with COVID it just seems like it's the natural progression now you can't go on a real tour and we don't know if it's even going to happen next year so a virtual tour but the challenge is your your traditional booking agent probably has no ability insight into booking a virtual tour um, so how did you overcome some of the challenges you encountered in, in putting this together? I mean, it, it, honestly, 
it was making a list of every state and kind of figuring out who do we know, who can we pitch. Um, it, it was nothing more glamorous than that. I mean, the you know the um, you know the main point about it in these cases, particularly with the venues, were like okay, so we put together a um, you know a short clip that uh, that venues, for instance, with Log Nation could place on their socials. You know, here's the time frame. Here's a we you know created artwork. For, for each of them, like there was going to be a tour, um, you know, that was uh, basically a, a virtual tour poster. Sure. You, you know, we basically promoted the shows as if they were live shows. And in fact, one of the things that we did to varying degrees of success is we even like pitched local media. So, okay, this show is happening tied to this venue. Um, it's going to go through, you know, through their socials and, and under their ages are you willing to cover and we did get folks to cover it that way and you know ultimately um you know there's a lot of press outlets and press people that are used to covering tour dates that are f trying to figure out what else they're going to cover uh and so it you know to be able to do something innovative like this um some people were game for it did you run into issues in having to educate the venues to what they would have to do what their involvement is because i've had i've had a few clients where we haven't put together a whole virtual tour but we put together spot virtual events and i'm finding that you know it it's rare to find somebody who completely goes oh yeah no problem i completely understand how we're going to do this live stream not an issue most of them are like why do you want to do this through our Facebook page? Why do you want to do this through us? What are we going to have to do? Do I have to get my IT guys in here to support this? Was there some education that had to be? Yeah, I think along? what we did is we had a very clear description that we could go to every single, uh, you know, every place that we go to, this is what we're doing. This is, you know, this, this is all this is going to take. Here's the artwork. We're pitching these outlets in your market. We've done this here. You know, I mean, that was the other thing is that there was a number of times where we actually like, we had coverage already so we could show like, this is what we, you know, what, what we achieved in these places. So, um, you know, and technically here's, I mean, in a weird way, it was almost like, I was going to describe it almost as a, as a writer, but it's like, Here's the description. This is how we're doing this. Um, and, um, you know, there was detail to get into, but obviously we did enough of them that it just became, um, it was a template. Did any of them, you know, because obviously one, once COVID hit, everybody jumped on live streaming, but I think it's evolving now that you're seeing more and more bands do live streams of pre-recorded shows because they can do a better job. Did you do a mixture of that? We did a mixture of that. We did a mixture of that. And I think that, um, I think it's going to continue to be that way. Um, Zach actually just did effectively kind of his record release show, you know, uh, a bit later. Um, and you know we had a lot of back and forth about what to do, and I think ultimately he just felt that sound wise and production wise it was better to do as a pre-recorded show, you know. Um, and uh, and I think it really depends. I mean, you know, for Brendan Benson, we just did this was pretty great. We did for Brendan um, a show out of the the five spot which is a venue in Nashville. Um, and it was a, you know, fully live live stream. Um, yeah. And Brendan had never performed any of these songs with a band ever. He had recorded the, the stuff on his own anyway. It was, he recorded all the instruments himself. So he had never played the stuff with a band. So, um, and, you know, it's super interesting actually because, so Brendan's record was, came out end of April. Um, the tour was supposed to start um, in May. He was supposed to play, play South by Southwest. Every single one of these things shut down. Uh, and so, you know, 
and I'm now I give myself credit for an idea as opposed to someone else. I, I had the idea of having him do um, a daily performance of one song. Just every day he was going to perform one song uh, and um, uh, for reasons that will be relatively clear, Brendan decided that he wanted to do it at 420 every day. Uh, so, yeah. um, <laughs> so, you wonder what that reason was. I, I, geez, I don't know. <laughs> um, so we did it at 420 Central Time every day for two or three months where Brendan just, you know, did either a song or he did some after a while we even set it up so it would be uh, a q a or anything else but he would do something every day for 420 uh at 420 and so this live stream what was actually really exciting there were a couple of things one uh third man goes through the orchard the orchard told us that they saw increased audio streams on brendan's record after this is happening which was so nice to do it's like okay this we're not just doing this for the sake of doing this. This is actually working. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the live stream that we did this past weekend, we had double the amount of people paying that we ever had on a single day. Um, so that was really cool. Um, yeah. You know, and we sold out, we did a bundle with posters and we sold out of all the posters that we did. I mean, it was really encouraging to see that when you put in that much effort and i really at this point have to say when brendan put in that much effort because it wasn't right, me right. Live stream every day um it, it made a difference and it worked yeah jumping back to to zach um yeah. tell me a little bit about your your partnership with mm for triple a radio and american songwriter what, what was their level of involvement uh i mean with mm it was um you know you know basically we felt that Zach's records were very, very radio friendly. And so, um, you know, and Greg, honestly, if you look at what he was able to achieve in terms of kind of dominating AAA radio and, uh, and then breaking those acts to pop, Greg knew better than anyone how to do it. And he had a relationship with, with them. So that was, you know, MM's involvement, American Songwriter, um, you know, we just worked very closely with them and we did a live stream with them. And American Songwriter, frankly, has just been a fantastic partner just for Missing Peace overall. Um, you know, we do so many artists that fit in with what they do. Um, so we've done advertising with them. And, and uh, so it was just a very natural thing to bring them into uh, into the Zach project on this because uh, you know it's um, the people that are paying attention to American songwriter is are exactly our core audience to 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 work the project. Got it. The for the virtual tour event, um, were you how are you monetizing those? Were you selling tickets? Were the shows free to attend? And you were looking for donations, selling merch you know, for Zach. For Zach, yeah. it was all, it was free. Um, there were. We did, we used um, Kofi um, for donations, which is basically like, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's, you know, it, it's a cool idea. It's basically that you're uh, donating money uh, kind of in um, $3 increments, basically like for a cup of coffee. Um, and uh, so, you know, just to make it kind of fit within people's mindset of, of sure. doing it. We did it that way for, um, for Brendan, it, we worked with a really great uh, streaming uh, platform called Noon Chorus um, that I've been super impressed by um, that just worked with a ton of uh, indie artists and, um, you know, I'm, you know, aiming to do a ton more with them. They've just been great to work with. I, I, I find this fascinating because it just seems like this is the evolution of where touring isn't ultimately going, but will have to go in conjunction with live in-person events. Because even when in-person events come back, I'd like to feel that these artists are going to sit here and go, well, gee, on my day off, I could do a live stream show, even if it's a pre-recorded one. I think, it, you, I think you're totally right, but I think it's it really, really depends 
on just how good someone is singing into a camera. Yes, um, yes. There's a lot know, to learn. Artists don't understand how to perform to no audience when it's a live stream. And, and, and in my experience, it's much easier to do this when you've got a solo performer as opposed to five okay. people in a band that you've got to pull five people together. So we've been working with um, the band Loka Connie for a bunch of years now with uh, Adam Wiener of Loka Connie for been press for about three years or so, if not more. Um, and I don't know if you've paid attention to his live stream, it's called Tough Cookies and he's been doing it for, for a while and it's just gotten a ton of press, really fantastic stuff. Um, and Adam, Adam's a ham. From the moment I'd ever seen Adam, Adam just, you know, he channels Jerry Lee Lewis and, and he, you know, th there's almost no one that is just as, you know, he's like Peter Wolf or Jay Giles or something like that. He's just, he, he's incredible in terms of what he does. So Adam just being able to play and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and it's also different. He's playing on his stand-up piano and he's jumping on it and he's stripping and he's, do, you know, literally doing everything to make it engaging as opposed to just, uh, I mean, it's super interesting. Like, you know, I am the biggest Rufus Wainwright fan in the world, but, you know, watching Rufus's uh, performances, who has an unbelievable voice and everything else, as opposed to watching Adam. Adam is just like everywhere. He's everywhere on that, you know, he, he makes you want to watch and engages you and everything. And so I think the, the point is, is that the way it's going to shake out is the people that actually work well with the media. Yep. Yep. You know? Exactly. And, and I think everyone, you know, got on board initially to say, Hey, I, you know, but it's, it, you know, it's more like, frankly, just thinking about someone say, who would have made a good YouTuber or who's a very good uh, person on TikTok or Instagram, you know, it just, and I think sometimes that gets figured out as people go along, you know, they just like, Oh, I, I'm good at this. I fit with this new technology. I didn't know. And that's, to me, that's what's super interesting is that I don't necessarily think that artists have an idea where they fit they become comfortable and they become, you know, almost more of themselves if they lock into that particular technology. And that's certainly true. I mean, Loka Connie are one of the best live bands you can see, but I would venture to say that Anna Wiener is the best live stream performer that's out there. Yeah, you know, that, 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 is, that is a big part of it. You either get it or you don't get it. Right. And for people like us, it's very difficult and challenging to help somebody get it when they just are not comfortable in front of a camera, they don't understand technology, they don't see the benefit of this. It becomes very difficult to bring a horse to water when they don't want to do it. Yeah, listen, I think they probably shouldn't. You know, you, you try it for a while, and if you're not good at it I mean I'm not saying that you, you you quit after a few tries but like there are people who you know we have these conversations all the time with clients in terms of like okay so let's talk about I mean we do a social media health check and we get to see like okay where are you in all these different platforms thus far figuring out who actually is going to be a natural at TikTok, like not so much, you know, there's not that many that really fit in our natural. So we're playing with it and then we make sure that the sounds are uploaded and everything else. But like, uh, you know, I've yet to work very closely. Actually, I shouldn't say that Brendan on his own without any kind of suggestion for me is the kind of smart goofball that like worked really well on TikTok just because that's who his personality is. He and he's done sure. nicely with that. Um, but I don't honestly, 
I mean, I, I think in a weird way, we have to think about technology the way if you think about someone picking up the right guitar or the right instrument, it just has to be the thing that fits right in your hands. You know, it just, no, you, you, to... you know, as you were describing this, it, it was making me think about 15, 18 years ago, I was part of the team that put together and launched some of the very first VIP meet and greet programs. And one of the things we never thought about this, but I quickly learned this after we had some major artists go through this. Not every artist wants to meet their fans. Shocking. Yeah, right. I know. I mean, we sit here and go, you, you, and, and you can't do a meet and greet program. You can't make an artist do a meet and greet program if they are just uncomfortable meeting fans and being in group, closed groups. Now, again, that's odd to think about somebody who's playing in front of 10,000 people won't go into a dressing room and meet 15 people, it is what it is. So you can't, and what that's what we learned is you have to find out up front, are you willing to do this? Is it something you're comfortable with? Is it who you are? If it isn't, there's nothing wrong with that. We just will go a different direction, but you can't be forced into doing something like that. And I think live streaming is the same thing. If if they just don't like it, if they're not comfortable, whatever the reasons are, you can't make them. Yeah, but I think the thing that I, that hopefully that you have with an artist and that you've built with an artist is a level of trust to try it, you know, to give it a shot and try sure. it and not give up immediately and just see like, okay, is this thing fit? You know, this is this thing that I'm starting to like. Um, and, uh, you know, especially because it's entirely new and because honestly, what the hell else are you doing? That's part yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, um, so try it and see how you feel, you know, and, um, you know, and then, you know, it's interesting because we're, we're talking to a lot of folks about Twitch now. Um, and you know, Twitch is such a, a big priority for for Amazon, and you know, it's a natural for people who are gamers, and there are people who that, that do that and fit into that. But Twitch is very much you know being looked at as well as just a another potential live stream channel that you know that ties in with Amazon. And but um, you know, it just I know, the thing that I know just in talking with artists and just talking with with Zach, and I think this is totally right, is there is no possible way that you can be master of every single one of these domains. You sort That's of have right. to pick a few lanes and yeah. be really good at it and it's and and um and then maybe not even after a while don't even have a presence there because you, you you're you know um I don't know it's a, it, and and that may be counterintuitive um some people i am not active on twitter i've never felt it just has never really worked for me i've never felt you know into it there are people that like you know doom scroll on twitter all the time i won't do it i'm on there a little bit maybe i shouldn't even be on because i'm because it, it i just don't post all that much um yeah. and i think like that's the thing but i think for artists to think right now it's um, it's about having the trust enough in your team to experiment and then being able to have an honest answer and say, I'm really, really good at, on, on, on Instagram. And that's where I should be working. Right. Yeah. yeah. We tell artists that all the time. I think you're spot on, Michael. I, it's, you know, you don't have to be there. Well, there's so much to do today, right? You got to write the songs, record the songs, play them live, do all this live streaming. And then on top of all of that, you have to do Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Roblox, whatever. That's a lot. And to your point, some artists are much better at uh, certain mediums or certain platforms. And there's no, there's no crime in saying, look, you are really good at Facebook or Instagram. You focus on that with your audience. 
you know, it's, it's better to be in a place where you're engaged and, and you're good at it. Um, be, be, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you really quickly about audience growth, because today the, the toughest lane in the music industry is going from zero to 60, developing an artist, getting, you know, some engagement, growing that audience. Um, what, what kind of things are you doing now since we're, we can't put artists out on the road other than, you know, like Zach's 50 state live stream tour, what kind of things can you do today to kind of help your artists go from zero to 60? I mean, I think some of this stuff is totally traditional. Um, I, I still am someone uh, that believes, you know, believes strongly in publicity. I really believe strongly in the idea of, um, of developing, you know, also obviously I feel like I'm working with artists that fit well into doing publicity for them. Um, and there, you know, and, and there are some that just that, that don't work, but that's one of the things that we do. But um, in terms of zero sixty, one of the things is, I mean, some of the stuff is is so simple. Um, like we get involved from the very beginning in terms of like working with an artist to craft their narrative and then talk to a buyer writer and tell the buyer writer, this is the narrative we want you to tell, rather than just hiring a buyer writer and having them tell us what the narrative is. Gotcha. You know, and, and, and um, you know, I often think about the idea, um, just kind of working closely with NPR over the years, you know, I say this to artists, okay, if you had an NPR story that was run about you, um, what would be the first minute and a half of the story? And if you don't know that, let's figure out what that is. Um, so, you know, um, I worked with uh, an artist named Andrew Combs uh, for a while, who, you know, was on uh, New West for, for quite a while. And um, Andrew also is really, really good. Um, he's, a great painter. He's extraordinarily good. Um, and, and it was a really interesting thing to, uh, to, to, to work with Andrew. So Andrew made a record. Um, Andrew made his fifth album. And we sat around and said, okay, Andrew is a great looking guy with a, a wife and daughter in Nashville. And what the hell is Andrew's story? And Andrew made the record and I, I called him up and I said, this is what we're doing. You're gonna do a painting of every single song on this record. And then we're gonna say that you were inspired after listening back to this record to, um, to express yourself visually the way you expressed yourself on record. This wasn't the case. We came up with that. We did a gallery show to um, to release the record, uh, and you know, and we publicized this. We got like a multi-page feature in No Depression with um, images of the paintings and the record, and that became the pitch. And like I, you know, so I do think. I mean, I think that every person that comes into the music industry have one element of, of things that, an angle that they come from. I come originally from being a music journalist, then I was a publicist. That's the, that's the, the view that I take. So it right. does, for me, start that way. Other people are amazing promotion people, uh, and they start with the idea of what station am I going to get this record on first, or what, you know, and, and I think all of us have different strengths in terms of, you know, how are you going to start a story of, of an artist? And so in a lot of cases, you know, we're thinking about publicity. We're also, as I mentioned, really looking to see just what an artist's um, underpinnings are 
in social media and, and you know and you know in terms of their profiles on DSPs and all of those sure. as well. You know, just you know, it's the it's the groundwork to start with that I think is extraordinarily important. And then um, having a very clear conversation about what are your expectations for this project over the next few months and how are we going to work yeah. to, to, to do them? I really don't, I don't believe if you're talking about someone uh, starting from zero, um, that there is by any means one template it's got to fit with the music that you're yeah agreed i mean there's just so many different paths because every artist is different well michael congratulations so much you know for first of all for growing uh missing peace uh, especially when you know at a time where you started it and really uh thank you for coming on and talking to us about this 50 state live stream tour i just thought that was really innovative and kind of a, a cool thing to do during uh during this pandemic where can people find you where can they learn more about missing peace uh well uh we certainly are you know, not twitter <laughs> no the, well yeah uh so it's missingpeacegroup.com uh, we are very active on Instagram, posting uh, both on the story and on Instagram itself, on cool. Facebook. Um, uh, that's probably the easiest way to, 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 uh, to get us. And to get awesome. Me. Michael, thank you so much for the insight into the, the, the virtual tour, because I, I do think it's something, the more we talk about it, the more we can maybe help some of these artists dip their toe in it and try it. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm more than happy to uh, try to help anywhere I can. Awesome. All right, man. Great Thank talking so to you, much. Michael. Thanks for joining us, man. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Discmakers.com. Use code FREEBIZ for ground shipping on CD orders of 100 units or more, $150 value. I I love the concept of that that 50 state virtual tour. I really do. I mean, I've taught. We've talked about it. Yep. publicly and privately. I've talked to clients about it. Um, it's cool to see somebody executing on it. I think it's one of those things where it's it's a great thought. It's not as easy as you think to That's pull right. Off. Yeah, and to actually have an audience, right? He was fortunate in that he's got a PR background. So he's already starting with PR. And then secondly, he has a radio partner, right, in MM, to help with well, he radio. had live nation which was a big help because live anybody nation, we've heard of <laughs> yeah it, it, exactly it's like you need a you need a venue that's got an audience and when we say audience we're referring to an online audience yeah obviously here everybody but you know venues have online audiences they have facebook pages they have email mm -hmm. lists all that sort of stuff yep so you know, you got somebody like a live nation who says, oh, yeah, we'll get you on six, eight, 12 different of our venues streaming through the, their their socials. Right. Dude, that's that that's half the battle right yeah. there. Yeah. And they partnered with American Songwriter. And I guess the moral to that story is if you're going to do one of these things, look for partners. That's exactly uh, it. You, you, you have you know that you can do this on your own. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more work. Um, you've got to look at the potential partner and go, what is their audience? What is their online audience size? Yep. You, you know, I've got, you know, if, if the band has 10,000 people on their Facebook page and the partner only has 5,000, mm, might not be worth the, the effort to do this. You're trying to find new audience members, a bigger audience to reach out to. Yeah. So you have to do that research too, to yep. make sure you're partnering with the right people. Um, I would also add to that, you once you've partnered, or well, before you partner with them, actually clarify right up front, what sort of marketing can they do for you? Yeah, and you know, you've had hey, a lot of experience with that, Michael, like when you're talking about with venues, some people don't take advantage of this, but in a yep. non-COVID world, when you're touring, Man, you got to partner with those venues. You have to drive traffic. You have to push them to drive traffic. You have to share assets. There's so many different things in that partnership yep. that'll put butts in the seats, but also will help you grow your audience. And and you know that that's why right up front, your first question should be, "Hey, you got a great looking social. Do you have an email list? Will we be able to? Will you be able to send out an email blast 
to your customer base promoting this? Yeah. Um, what else, you know, would you split costs of Facebook boosts? Any, anything along those lines? Because the point being, it's too late to ask for that stuff after you've agreed to everything. That's right. And it's done. It's, it's, it's done. So yeah. the, yeah. And, and, and prepare yourself. He brought it up a clear outline of what the partner has to do, because yeah. I found this where it's like, well, what do you mean? How do I Facebook stream you to my Facebook page? Well, it's quite simple and you know, yeah. it's painless and it's very quick and easy and blah, blah, blah. But you're dealing with a whole new world here. That venue general manager knows how to manage a physical establishment yeah he not a not facebook know. page or not an instagram page or not a youtube channel so yeah um good advice. I, it, it it was a fun discussion and i'm glad uh I, I'm, I'm glad to see people doing this yeah me too we've talked about it a bunch and it's it's thrilling to kind of see somebody not only do it but be successful at it yeah. so yep kudos yep. Um, so before we wrap up, thank you to Hypebot and Bands in Town, and of course to our sponsors, uh, Bandzoogle and DiscMakers.com. Thank you so much for everything you all do for us week in and week appreciate out. It. It, yep. It's greatly appreciated. If you are watching us on uh, YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening on Spotify, follow us and what is it? You can now, you can now, um, Pin bookmark, 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 bookmark yeah. episodes, bookmark us. I don't know what we gain from it, but do it. <laughs> yeah. It's new. <laughs> it's new. Do it. Bookmark <laughs> us and follow us on, on Spotify and subscribe and leave a review and ratings on iTunes. And, uh, that's it from the four seasons. <laughs> Living large, Michael. <laughs> see everybody next week. <laughs>